Craving the perfect holiday snack? Check out Farmer Bill's Biltonk. Think beef jerky, but better. No sugar, no preservatives, just pure animal protein goodness. Crafted from premium grass-fed beef or bison and air-dried to perfection, Farmer Bill's Biltong is nutrient-packed, energy-dense, and perfect for an on-the-go treat or a standout snack for your next party. My favorite is the original bison, but the other flavors like the original beef, smokehouse, and spicy chili have me second-guessing that choice more than once. Visit FarmerBillsProvisions.com to grab a one-pound slab or a variety pack and use code BIZBIT10 for 10% off. Farmer Bills Biltong, don't be the two-liter guy at this year's Christmas party. Now you can say, you can sit back, it never happens here, it's never going to happen in America, never going to have capital controls, never going to have price controls, never going to get our wealth seized even though it happened already before in our history. These things can and do happen. So... The reason I am involved in Bitcoin is is not because I think it's going to happen in America. It's because I want America to never have these problems. And in order for a country to be strong and resilient against these kinds of problems, the best thing you can do is to create resiliency in the system. Welcome to the Business Bitcoinization Show, the show dedicated to helping you enrich your life and grow your business with Bitcoin, the hardest money on planet Earth. I'm your host, Josh Friedemann, and our guest today is Jan Pritzker, who's the co-founder of Swan Bitcoin. Now, towards the end of the interview, we are going to be talking about how Swan could be a great partner for you and your business, but we're also going to be talking about Jan's book, Inventing Bitcoin, which you'll be able to download for free if you're interested, as well as his perspective on Bitcoin as someone who moved from the former Soviet Union to the United States and his multiple decades of experience as a successful tech entrepreneur who's not only helped to start companies, but to grow them and then to successfully exit them. In other words, we cover a lot, and I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation with Jan. As always, before we get to our interview, we have this week's Bitcoin Meetup Spotlight, and this week it is the Kansas City Bitcoiners. KC Bitcoiners is a Bitcoin Meetup group based in the Kansas City metro area with two evening meetups per month. These meetups include presentations, guest speakers, or just casual discussions. They also do lunch and coffee meetups for those who can't make the evening meetings. All levels of Bitcoiners are welcome. And for any business owners out there, hopefully there are a number of you listening to this podcast right now. They have several members who have experience onboarding merchants to Bitcoin. They're also planning their second ever Bitcoin block party for October 23rd. So mark your calendars. This will feature vendors and local musicians with all transactions paid in Bitcoin. For more info about future events, check them out at kcbitcoiners.com or at kcbitcoiners on Twitter. Those two links are in the show notes below, along with a list of other local Bitcoin meetups across the United States. If you're interested in finding one near you, click on that link and you'll be able to look by state and then by city and find the closest meetup to you and the best person to get in contact with for more information. Now, we're going to get to our interview with Jan right after this. Business owners, unlock the benefits Bitcoin has to offer your business with the Bitcoin for Business Quick Start Guide. This 27-page guide highlights the six ways you can grow your business with Bitcoin. Check it out in the show notes. Jan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Josh. So I'd like to start off every single interview with a few questions to help us to get to know you a little bit better and give us some insight for our own lives. Are you ready for these? Absolutely. Absolutely. When and how did you first learn about Bitcoin? So I first learned about Bitcoin in 2011. Um, it was from a post on Slashdot, which was a website for news, kind of nerd news, tech news. Saw it being mentioned as a payment system, uh, some kind of open source project. Didn't really understand what it was. Uh, it was kind of in passing for me, but I did end up buying some actually because I thought, hey, I don't know what this is, but you know, if, if, it's, uh, if it looks like it's promising, but why not? So I bought some at like 30 bucks and saw it go down to $2 uh, over the <laughs> course of like the next year or so. And basically thought, what did I just get into? I don't really understand this. I don't know what this is. Um, ended up basically selling the bottom. So that was my first experience with Bitcoin. And, and I didn't really research it or understand it at that time. And then from there, when was it that you feel like you really first started to grasp the potential, which I guess is something that people are still doing today, kind of understanding what the potential is. But when did you first start realizing this is something that could be serious? Yeah, I think the it's come. it was definitely in waves. The, the next time that I touched it was in 2013. And, uh, I, you know, kind of unsurprisingly, 2013 was a hype cycle year. So the price had gotten up to about $1,000. 
And, uh, you know, every time there's a hype cycle, you hear about it more and more. So I kind of dug it out of my memory banks and I was like, wait, a Bitcoin, that thing that I, you know, messed around in 2011 is still alive and now it's worth a thousand dollars. Um, that's interesting. So I looked at it, I, I saw, um, I used Coinbase, which was a pretty, uh, early Bitcoin on-ramp app that was actually pretty good at that time. Today, of course, it has turned into a casino, so I don't <laughs> use it anymore. But, uh, at that time it was a very nice, uh, way to get into Bitcoin. So I bought some Bitcoin there. Um, and then again, it went down to like $300 and I still had not actually, uh, read the white paper at that point or really done any research on Bitcoin. So pretty much, you know, kind of forgot about it because I was working on startups. Um, and you know, that's pretty demanding of my time and energy and, and focus. So I wasn't really looking at Bitcoin at all as a serious thing. And so it wasn't really until 2016 when, uh, I heard about it again from a friend of mine or, uh, who told me basically that. Uh, big companies were looking into it, uh, specifically Microsoft, you know, was kind of looking at, uh, actually it was more Ethereum at that time. Microsoft was looking at blockchain strategy, quote unquote. So I kind of came in in 2016 from that angle saying, hey, Bitcoin didn't die. It's still around. It's actually kind of interesting. And there's all this blockchain stuff around it. So I started researching uh, first Ethereum and kind of understanding how all that ecosystem worked and then kind of got it more into the overall blockchain world spent about a year listening to like various podcasts on blockchain things. And then I was like, this is just crazy. Uh, I need to understand Bitcoin because I'm, I'm getting way too far ahead of myself. And it seems like all of this stems from Bitcoin because I kept hearing those kind of origin story. And that's when I fell down the, the Bitcoin rabbit hole because I actually started watching uh, videos by Andreas uh, Antonopoulos. And I heard him talk about Bitcoin as a monetary revolution. Uh, specifically this video called Currency Wars, where he talks about the failures of many currencies and how governments are using currencies to go to war against each other. And this all blew my mind because I never really had studied, you know, even in basic economics. Uh, I mean, I knew like what supply and demand was, but sure. uh, beyond that, never studied macro, never really understood what was going on in the world with money, never understood how, what the purpose of money was, how governments are controlling it. So all of the stuff that I learned, I finally understood what the purpose of Bitcoin was. But it actually took me even from then, I think this was around early 2017, um, probably took me another year of kind of like absorbing that knowledge and studying Bitcoin to really fully kind of exit the, the you know, the altcoin and blockchain space because I was working with a company and trying to advise them on, on how to do like blockchain scalability stuff and helping them with infrastructure and finally realized like, hey, all of this is just kind of a joke. I mean, it's like for corporate prototypes of things and um, you know, Bitcoin is really where the revolution is. So that's that's when I decided to focus in on it around like early 2019. Now, I have a few follow-up questions. I'm going to refrain from asking them for now because we need to get on to question number two, which is this. What's an insight or fact about Bitcoin that you wish that everyone understood? Wow. Um, I, think, I think understanding how it's not possible to change its rules is really, really interesting. That is not immediately obvious at all when you talk about Bitcoin because there's all this stuff about Bitcoin is limited in the supply and Bitcoin is, you know, secure and all this other stuff. OK, but there's nothing that really explains like in a one sentence format why it's true that it's limited in supply. Why can't the supply be just inflated, which is, the, you know, the the question that every newbie to Bitcoin is like, well, why can't I just copy it? Like, you know, how do you know that they're not going to make more of them? And that's that's I think is a very interesting uh, topic to explore because a lot of people don't realize that there is no they there's not like they can make more Bitcoin. It's the decentralized consensus that makes sure that there's no Bitcoin uh, created mm -hmm. beyond the, you know, what's programmed. And that is not trivial and not obvious. <laughs> yeah. Question number three, what's the Bitcoin resource you most recommend to other people? I, wow. Okay. So I, I actually recommend my book because there's a reason I wrote it <laughs> because it's very short um, and I really like it. But outside of that, I really do like the Andreas videos still, the very early Andreas videos. I still recommend them all the time. Uh, Currency Wars is a really good one. And then Monument of Immutability is another really good one that explains uh, proof of work. So I still do recommend those. Um, the reason I, I caveat that is because if you watch later Andreas stuff, it kind of veered off into blockchain land for some reason because he was totally on the right track initially and then kind of lost the plot. Um, but yeah, those videos are really good. Beyond Bitcoin, what's a resource or idea that's been valuable to you or your company recently? To be honest, I don't use a lot of outside resources. I'm kind of weird. Like, I don't actually read a lot of books. I did use, I read a ton of business books in my youth, like in my 20s. I just digested everything by Seth Godin and all this other stuff. And then, like, I just don't listen to other people anymore. <laughs> maybe I, maybe it's because I'm, like, getting older and I just feel like I need to generate my own ideas. 
Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, just looking at the industry and, and learning from what other people are doing uh, in terms of, you know, Bitcoin treasury management and things like that has, has been interesting. Uh, looking at like Michael Saylor's actions in the market has been interesting. It's been educational for me in terms of how you think about like debt and, you know, where the dollar is going and stuff like that. That's been interesting, but maybe not specific to uh, growing a business. So our, our fifth question is what we call our arbitrary but insightful question. And it's this, as a general life principle, is it better to ask why or why not? You're really coming up with the deep questions. <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting to say why not? Because like kind of assume that, you know, like why can't we do this? You know, I think it's it's more of an optimistic stance. It's more of a like, why is this not achievable? Or asking why has nobody done this when it seems like it should be a thing? is also can be very educational because sometimes the answer is, it's just not possible. And here are all the reasons why, but I think it does give you some, some insights. Meet Linkster, your premier Bitcoin focused advisor. Linkster caters to businesses, institutions, family offices, and high net worth individuals. They merge your unique financial goals and needs with Linkster's Bitcoin expertise to craft your own sustainable plan to preserve and grow the value of your hard earned profits and retained earnings. And Linkster is not just advice, it's tailored execution. Connect directly with the founder by visiting linkster.com. That's L Y N C S T E R. Dot com Linkster. Secure your future with Bitcoin. Today's episode of Business Bitcoinization is proudly brought to you by Vellus Commerce, where the future of business technology meets Bitcoin. As we journey through the era of Bitcoin and its transformational impact on businesses, there's one name that stands out. Vellus Commerce. Whether you're looking to build a cutting edge website, a seamless mobile app, or custom software, Vellus is your go to team. They've been diving deep into the world of Bitcoin since 2014, making them one of the most experienced groups for integrating Bitcoin and Lightning payments into a variety of digital platforms. But here's what truly sets them apart Vellus Commerce doesn't just build, they bring a wealth of knowledge to ensure your project success from day one. Their team understands the nuances of Bitcoin, ensuring that your business stays ahead of the curve. And for all business Bitcoinization listeners out there, Vellus Commerce is offering a free consultation to kickstart your project the right way. So if you're ready to future proof your business in the coming age of hyper Bitcoinization, head over to VellusCommerce.com or reach out on Twitter at Vellus Commerce. Let's make sure your business thrives in the Bitcoin era. Well, Jan, we're here today to talk about Swan Bitcoin. You're the co-founder. There are a number of directions I want to take this interview, but the first one is, you, know, you just alluded to inventing Bitcoin. We talk about it on this show. I think it's a, a great way to understand a lot of more complicated parts of Bitcoin, but in an easy to understand way. So maybe could you share with us a little bit about that and why you thought it was important to write the book? Because like you just said, you wrote it because you thought it was important and it needed to be said. So I'm just curious to kind of yeah. understand the why behind it and, and some of the impact you've seen from it. Well, when I started learning about Bitcoin, again, this is more like 2016 onwards, um, there's lots of great articles. Actually, one of the best resources that I found was the Nakamoto Institute, which is Piero Chardin and, and Michael Goldstein, Bitstein. Lots of really, really nice, concise articles that you can read in like, you know, a couple of minutes and just really, really good um, with, with the core ideas about Bitcoin and the overall ecosystem. Uh, economics, things like that. But I found that it was hard. There was no real books that were like really good about explaining Bitcoin from beginning to end, how the whole thing works. There was like Mastering Bitcoin from Andreas. Uh, it's very, very thick. It's got a lot and it's very, uh, I would say it's geared towards uh, developers. So people who actually want to program in Bitcoin. Um, you know, so there's stuff like that was out there. Then the Bitcoin Standard came out, which was Safe's book. Also a very good book. Um, also very economics focused. So great if you want to really dive into how money works and all that kind of stuff, but also quite a lot. And, you know, you hand a book like that, somebody trying to orange pill them, it's just, um, it's daunting. So I wanted to have something that was the best of both worlds, a little bit of economics, a little bit of technology, a little bit of the why behind why Bitcoin was built. And I found myself explaining this to people all the time. I was basically giving talks in high schools, explaining this to high schoolers. And the original concept for the book was, can I write a book at a high school level that will explain how Bitcoin works to the point where these people can go on and explain it to their friends. And uh, so that was really important to me to be able to explain it to others uh, is, you know, if you can teach something, that means you understand it, right? So I actually started writing the book as my own understanding process so around 2019. In the process of writing a book, I basically became a Bitcoin maximalist because I was actually, as I was researching Bitcoin, as I was reading, uh, I, I took a lot of time reading Satoshi's original forum posts. I actually got this book called The Book of Satoshi, which 
is basically like every forum post and every discussion he's ever had that's really of relevance. And, you know, all these questions that came up in early Bitcoin history, how he answered them. So as I was like reading this stuff, I started digesting and understanding what his motivations were. And then the book was written from the perspective of like, what problems was he trying to solve? How did he solve them? That's why I call them call it inventing Bitcoin. It's like, how was Bitcoin invented? Or at least we can put ourselves in the mindset of Satoshi and, and say, okay, here are some of the issues. Here's how he might've addressed them. It's obviously not probably the way that he actually went about doing it, but you know, I try to break it down into like how I would invent Bitcoin if I had to solve these problems, right? Yeah. And, and to your point, first of all, I, I've read it while I've listened to it. I'm more of an audiobook guy, but it's the book that uh, it's the first uh, book that our meetup here in Jackson, Mississippi is going through to kind of help people who are coming to it for the first time. And even if you're not, you're going to pick up quite a few nuggets. So once again, listeners, if you would like to get Inventing Bitcoin, I believe it's uh, you could use my affiliate link or just go to swan.com slash free book. Is that the correct link? That's exactly right. It's one.com slash free book. Um, you can also get it on Amazon. You can get an Audible, but you can get it for free. I mean, you know, share it with folks. Absolutely. It's nice to buy as a gift. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for for sure. So maybe the next thing before we get to some of the things about Swan, there are two things I want to ask you about. First of all is blockchain. Maybe just give us a little bit of a history of, you know, blockchain was a buzzword a few years ago. Why Bitcoin, not blockchain? I think it's still a buzzword. It's not going away very easily, but um, so actually a, a great article on this is Jimmy Song's article called Why Bitcoin Not Blockchain. I think it's exactly the title of it, something like that. Um, and Jimmy was actually one of my teachers when I got into the Bitcoin space. I took his course called uh, Programming Blockchain at the time. Now he put out a book called Programming Bitcoin, mm. which is kind of funny. But uh, the course was all about Bitcoin and, and how, how it works. But Jimmy was very good at identifying these issues. And, and to me, uh, I actually lived through the hype cycle of the word cloud in 2006. And it's exactly the same parallel. Uh, in that time, I was, you know, working at a, an actual cloud startup. We were actually developing, uh, you know, a new way to deploy uh, software into the cloud. And the actual innovation of cloud was basically, you know, on-demand provisioning of resources. That's what cloud really is, cloud computing. Then what the word cloud became was basically anything on the internet was cloud. So you just step, <laughs> the word cloud became, you know, every, every uh, startup was a cloud startup, right? And if, Essentially, it, it obfuscated and erased the actual innovation, which was on-demand resource pricing, API-driven on-demand resources. And it turned it into like, oh, it's just in the cloud, right? And now we just refer to things in the cloud and we mean on the internet. So we've lost the meaning of the word. Um, I think the same exact thing happened in, in Bitcoin because essentially uh, the Bitcoin system is built on a data structure called a blockchain, okay? It's a chain of blocks, hence blockchain. Uh, that's not a word that Satoshi actually used. It's a word that came later. I, I actually don't know the history of the word, but it appeared at some point, you know, in this, uh, in the history of Bitcoin to describe a chain of blocks. It's a blockchain. Okay, sure. There's no innovation in the blockchain structure. Actually, uh, for if anybody's listening to this as a developer, if you use Git, which is a very common developer tool for, for versioning your source code, Git is also a blockchain. It is a chain of blocks. They are, you know, they're using Merkle hashes, which is exactly how... Uh, Bitcoin works as exactly the same technology, okay? But Git didn't solve the problem that Bitcoin solved, right? Git solved the source code versioning problem. Bitcoin solved the problem of being able to have digitally spendable money that doesn't have, you know, that can't be spent more than once. So truly unique, truly immutable money once you send it from point A to point B, it's no longer at point A. So they solved the problem of digital scarcity and uh, and that is a problem that had never been solved. So uh, the blockchain itself is not an interesting thing. It's just kind of like a database structure. Um, I think what people have come to mean with it when they say, oh, we're, we're doing blockchain, a lot of companies, especially in the last couple of years, did this. They had blockchain you know, POCs, like proof of concept things where they thought that they were going to share data with other companies on some hosted thing that they would all somehow, you know, would be somehow permissionless. And yet, of course, it's not permissionless because there's corporations involved. So, I mean, there's essentially it's misunderstanding the problem that Bitcoin solves. And, and, you know, from one perspective, yes, there's this new concept, oh, we can share data now, but you could always share data. You just didn't have a word for it. So now you have a word for it. So now, of course, you want to slap it on everything called blockchain just because you have multiple entities sharing some kind of ledger. That doesn't make it a blockchain or, or, or that's not the interesting part here. So I think the real innovation is digital scarcity. That's what Bitcoin did. If you look at what actually has come from everybody who's tried to take this blockchain concept and build something with it, it's either a corporate proof of concepts that went nowhere because, first of all, you can't you can't run 
real corporations on a public blockchain because there are privacy issues. A, there's cost issues. You're competing with other users of this blockchain, which is scarce resources. So you're not never gonna you're never gonna do that. Or you have this whole other world where you have like you know these DeFi systems, which are basically like gambling systems built on top of other gambling systems using tokens that don't have any value to gamble for other tokens. So there's this whole house of cards thing. And yeah, it has a use case. I mean, gambling is, is a valid use case. That's all it is. So I think it's uh, that's what sort of came of, of the blockchain revolution. Now, the other thing I want to talk to you about, and this is something that I just wanted to ask you personally, like re- Reverb.com, you were the the founder, co-founder uh, there. Uh, co-founder. It was, it was founded by, by a guy named David Kalt, who's, uh, who owned the guitar store, actually, which is really cool. Okay. I come from a family of musicians and we've, uh, there are a number of us who have used reverb multiple times. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I know that Etsy has it now, but kind of curious, just like you've come from the startup space. You've been involved in a lot of different things. Uh, You've consulted other people. I'm curious, do you see any interest in a number of those companies? Are you aware of interest in adopting Bitcoin, uh, beginning to use Bitcoin in their businesses, or is it just like it feels totally irrelevant to them still, even though they're kind of in the tech world and more aware of Bitcoin than maybe the average person on the street? You know, I think that um, it's, so I come from the tech world, right? I I was a CTO at Reverb and all of the people that I know best at Reverb are developers. I think like one guy, maybe two out of like 40 came out of that a Bitcoiner. Um, and it's very, very strange. It's actually, I think, pervasive in tech circles to misunderstand Bitcoin. Hmm. And I think uh, the reason is a couple of things. One, tech people specifically, they tend to be you know, very privileged, the, especially the people in my circle, they live in the US, they're very highly paid. They don't really have the problems that Bitcoin s- solves, right? Like even inflation isn't really a big deal for wealthy tech people, generally speaking because they can afford, okay, the prices go up, all right, no problem. You know, I mean, making 250 grand as like a junior developer at at Facebook or something like, okay, so milks up a bit. Um, But it's not, it doesn't solve the problems that they have. So A, that's one thing. Two is they seem to be extremely liberal. And that somehow is, I mean, there are liberal Bitcoiners, but it's very hard to find. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think because there's a propensity for this, like, you know, on the liberal side, the idea that government solves all problems and Bitcoin is literally telling you no, this is a problem the government has created, actually, and we need to take this out of their hands. So for a lot of people, that's very disconcerting. It's like, oh, my God, you know, money. No, money should be controlled by the government. Like, what would we do in a crisis if we can't just print money? Um, this is very scary to people. So I think this concept that we can actually have a monetary system outside of the hands of the government is not compatible with a lot of values that tech people specifically have. Um, and, you know, I myself, and you know, we can get into this, but I, I came from the former Soviet Union, and perhaps that's only one of the reasons that I have always had a you know distrust in the system because I know what, like stories from my parents and what they went through in a system that was sort of centrally controlled. I've had that distrust, and so that I think helps me see it a little bit. Versus most people are like, okay, well, I don't have this problem, or I have heard X, Y, and Z in the media, and therefore you know I don't want to research it, or it sounds like a Ponzi scam or whatever which are all very, very weak things once you actually dig into what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. It might be interesting to hear a little bit more of that perspective. One of the questions I was going to ask you is, in your bio we read that you talk about freedom and how Bitcoin enables that. I'm, I'm curious, what are some thoughts, some pieces of insight that you can provide business owners, especially in the United States, that don't... They, they may see it, they may worry about it, but they don't necessarily experience it. And when I say they, I mean me as well. I mean, it's just not one of those things that's like a, a massive concern, although it's, it's maybe more in the back of our minds more consistently now. But just any thoughts, insights, uh, perspective you could provide to people who are a little more privileged in the United States? Yeah, well, I, I think it is important to look at what's happening in other places because just because it isn't happening here doesn't mean it won't happen here. There's this very like, complacency, I think, in the US, you know, we are the imperial power of the world and and we are the world reserve currency. And there's so many privileges that we have that nobody else has that make us feel like we're immune to everything else. You know, oh, this other government turned authoritarian overnight, but we're not going to do that because, you know, we're very strong. We have very strong property rights. You know, government's not going to go seize all our our wealth here. It might happen somewhere else. Uh, Government's not going to do capital controls here. It might happen somewhere else. But this is like a very flawed idea, right? Th- these things literally happen overnight. I mean, look at any of these countries that have uh, you know, totalitarian dictatorships. 
many of them turned that way very, very quickly overnight. Many of them went from being very wealthy countries. I mean, Venezuela was one of the richest countries in South America. And now, you know, oops, like, you know, complete takeover by by communism and, you know, printing money left and right. And it, like, it, it's a disaster. So these things do happen very quickly. And thinking that it's not going to happen here is, is, I think, a very big fallacy. And even if it doesn't happen here, I think at least having some protection against, you know, inflation and things like that is is important. But I, again, I, I want to just kind of call out, you know, for example, where, where we came from in the Soviet Union, completely centrally planned economy, complete price controls, right? And look, look right now in the news cycle, what are people calling for? Gas is going too high. Let's have some price controls, right? Uh, that's how it starts. It's always a populist thing. It's always like, let's fix, you know, yeah, people can't afford their gas or their milk. So let's just put some price controls on there. That's where it starts. Okay. Where it ends is that, you know, your apartment in the Soviet Union is free. It's great, but you got to wait 20 or 30 years to get one. A uh, pair of jeans costs you a month's salary because they're not available. You have to stand in line for bread, right? That's what price controls leads to because price controls destroys the ability of the economy to communicate. The price is a communication signal in the economy. So that's something that is broken in centrally planned economies and hence why the Soviet Union had so many problems. That's point number one. Point number two is in these centrally controlled economies, you typically have capital controls. Beyond even price controls, you just like can't take money in or out of the country. Uh, for example, owning dollars was illegal in the Soviet Union. If you wanted to get dollars today in Argentina, you can only get 200 of them per month. Mm -hmm. And you pay like a 30% tax or, or more, I think now. So this kind of system, you can't get money in or out. You can't get real money, which is to me, it's either dollars or Bitcoin are the only real monies available in the world today. Beyond, you know, beyond that, it's kind of <laughs> degrades in different ways. Um, and so you can't get those items. In the Soviet Union, when we left, they exchanged $100 per person for us. So all of our rubles, you know, they were worthless. So we get, we left the country with $400 in our pockets. Uh, now you can say, you can sit back, it never happens here. It's never going to happen in America. Never going to have capital controls. Never going to have price controls. Never going to get our wealth seized, even though it happened already before in our history. These things can and do happen. So the reason I am involved in Bitcoin is is not because I think it's going to happen in America. It's because I want America to never have these problems. And in order for a country to be strong and resilient against these kinds of problems, the best thing you can do is to create resiliency in the system. We created a really strong governmental structure here. We have three branches of government that all check each other, at least in theory. Um, that is a really strong structure. And part of the reason why America's done well is because we actually have to have these three branches fight it out to make any changes, except for the whole system is distorted by central banking because that system allows complete influence and control over all of the other three, right? So now we need to create the fourth branch. The fourth branch is an independent money, which is Bitcoin. Um, and actually was how our constitution was written. Money is gold and silver. Nobody should print anything other than that. So, um, you know, that's why I'm interested in Bitcoin. It's not because I'm a doomsayer and like, I think we're going to turn into the Soviet Union tomorrow. It's because I would like us to have a strong future. I would like my friend, my children to grow, grow up in a country with strong property rights, strong freedoms. And, and those things are only possible with, with free money, with Absolutely. Uh, liberty money. Yeah. Well, so that, that helps us to uh, move into the little portion about Swan at the end here. I was planning on talking more about Swan, but I think one thing that would be valuable is maybe talking about how people can be thinking about, you know, why why Swan is a great option and some of the things that kind of uh, promotes the best of freedom money, so to speak. Well, one of the things that we're really, really keen on is education. That's, you know, I think that's visible in our team, obviously myself. We also have a bunch of really great authors and podcasters on our, our team, Stefan Levera, uh, Andy Edstrom, Brady Swenson, like all these folks that have written books have created great shows and educational content. You know, we are what makes Swan special because not only are we out there, you know, kind of promoting this education, but we're handholding our customers, especially uh, those on the corporate or high net worth side. They can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with us. We can really guide them as to the best way to understand Bitcoin, um, how to buy some. Obviously, we we serve uh, people of all of all kinds, but uh, businesses, small family businesses are, are big with us, um, trusts and IRAs and long-term savings plans for, for people who are looking to, um, save Bitcoin for their children. You know, that's something that we really, really care about and really help people with. So we are, I think, going to be your best, you know, Bitcoin friend, your, your best option to have somebody that you can rely on to ask a question. 
And if there's a service that we can't provide, we'll steer you to another company or another uh, you know, open source or self-sovereign option that is something that we believe in and, and you know, think is, is a good option for you. So we're not afraid to send people to other places when it makes sense. We ultimately want to make you know, more Bitcoiners. That's our mission is we want more people to understand Bitcoin. And uh, that involves uh, self-sovereignty. So you know, we encourage withdrawing your coins from our platform, which is quite different from most uh, platforms that actually want you to keep coins there and trade with them. You know, something like Coinbase, where they want you to literally just be part of their casino and lose money while they earn fees. Um, you know, that is not our model. We don't want your coins. We want you to buy coins. We want you to take them off the platform. We want you to learn how to do self custody. Um, we will help you with all of those things as needed. And you know, that that makes it special. So no withdrawal fees for us. Uh, automatic withdrawals that, that trigger every week, if you like. Um, all of those things that you know encourage sort of correct and good Bitcoin behavior, which is good for you and good for Bitcoin, right? That's ultimately what we want is it's, if it's good for Bitcoiners, it's good for Bitcoin. That's that's what Swan does. And, you know, this isn't I don't want to put this on people listening to this right now, but if you were to look online, if you were to go on Twitter, you'd find that a lot of the the biggest voices, the most respected voices are somehow connected to or promote Swan. So that's just one thing. It's like it's very telling. You start looking at like, you know, who are the people that are actually the movers and shakers? And for whatever reason, they're all saying, you know, Swan is is the way to go. So that's just a little uh, plug from the outside as well. I mean, the reason is because we're we are transparent and we take care of our customers. You know, ultimately, like we, our mission is very clear. We want to create more Bitcoiners. We benefit when that happens, but so does the entire Bitcoin ecosystem. So that's ultimately what it is. Well, I've appreciated also in conversations with Terrence in my early days at Swan. He, he would recommend products. This to your point, this Swan didn't provide, but he's like, hey, these are the best in class. We don't do this, but this is where we'd recommend you go. And that's mm-hmm. just you know knowing that there's a company out there that has your back when it comes to something as important as freedom money is is really valuable. Absolutely. Maybe final thoughts uh, that you might have before we finish up today. Anything you'd like to leave the listeners with, especially uh, pertaining to their their businesses or just just their their finances and their potential future relationship with Swan. Yeah, I would just call out that there is a lot of business adoption of Bitcoin going on that is not talked about. So you know, kind of earlier in 2020, 2021, you started seeing um, you know big corporations, big public corporations, Tesla, MicroStrategy, come out and say like really huge headline numbers. You know, we're buying billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars of Bitcoin. We had some insurance companies buy Bitcoin. Um, so there's been a normalization of Bitcoin in corporate America, although I would say it seems like it's sort of slowed down in the large, you know, kind of publicly traded space. It has not slowed down at all in the small and medium sized business, family business space. Those businesses are coming to us every day and asking for, you know, guidance. How should I buy Bitcoin? How do I store it? Well, how would I deal with it? Um, we serve them, right? And, you know, Swan is just one of many players in the industry that serves businesses. So I have to believe that if we're seeing all these all this activity, that everybody else is as well, or else you know maybe we're the best at it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, we we do have a very quick onboarding time. I think it's the industry's fastest. I think we can get businesses on board within about a day from zero mm-hmm. to you're buying Bitcoin. Um, you know, if your docs are all in order, we can get you buying Bitcoin within a day, and that is really powerful. And there's tons of reasons to buy Bitcoin. You know, there's we have like car dealerships, right, that have Bitcoin treasuries. Uh, we have, you know, uh, churches, we have, um, you know, all, all kinds of businesses that and nonprofits that basically are thinking about the long term future. They're not thinking about tomorrow. They're thinking about what happens when I need to pass this business to my kids. Where is that treasury going? I mean, the the dollar is undergoing serious inflation, double digits, I think. I mean, it's not CPI inflation is not the real number. Um, you have actual inflation of the money supply. If you understand what that means, you understand your dollars are losing value and you need a place to put them. Um, everything out there is a risk asset. The stock market is extremely risky, hi- hyper pumped. Um, Bitcoin is the future of money. And yes, it has volatility, uh, which you know a lot of times we don't understand in America because we think, oh, wow, Bitcoin is very volatile because we measure it against the dollar. But in other places, it's a far superior choice. I mean, it's a far superior choice to the Argentine peso or the Venezuelan Bolivar because those currencies are hyperinflating. So your choice is very clear in those economies, right? And if those economies make that choice, that that boost the value of Bitcoin over time, you're going to benefit from owning some as well. Um, so I encourage everybody, especially business owners, to start thinking about diversifying their treasury holdings beyond the dollar. That is 
it is dangerous to be long dollars. Uh, I really, I really believe that, you know, and who knows how long this inflation, I mean, the inflationary effects we're seeing today is not, it's, it's from what happened two years ago. I mean, they printed a ton of money. They, you know, the dollar supply was inflated tremendously. So um, it's not going to stop, but this is just the trailing effects of that. And, and if you think that the, you know, the current sort of macro environment with the Fed tightening rates is going to last, I mean, I don't think that's, I don't think that's realistic. Um, I think it's it's going to all go to zero again, and you know we're going to have even more inflation of the money supply, because that's the only way this whole system. I mean, literally, we're the economy is a Ponzi scheme. It literally is a Ponzi scheme. If you don't keep printing, you, you're going to default on your debt. You're going to have a problem. So uh, it's going to keep going. So you know you got to make a choice as, as how to how to protect your legacy, um, money that you've worked for for a long time. Uh, to me, that that is Bitcoin. So the only kind of money that that'll be truly yours and truly uh, resistant to theft, inflation, debasement. Well, Jan, you've given us a lot to think about. Fortunately, there are things that we can do based off of what you've said. Swan is a great partner if you're interested in Bitcoin. I certainly recommend all listeners to at least check them out and see if it will work for you. But Jan, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, friends, it's a wrap. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Business Bitcoinization Show. If you want to reach out, our email is info at bizbitshow.com. Also, if you haven't done so yet, go ahead and scroll on down to the show notes. There you'll find ways to connect with me and our guest, as well as our excellent sponsors who can help you succeed in your life and in your business. Keep building, keep growing, and until next time, keep living and leading well. If you're a regular listener of the podcast, thank you. If you want to take a further step in your support for the show, you can help us grow by listening on Fountain, a value for value podcast app on iOS or Android. If you hear something you like that you disagree with or anything else, you can share it by sending some sats and adding a comment with your thoughts. Some of you have already done this and I appreciate it. I'm going to begin reading your boosts on upcoming episodes. So if you have some insight or value to add, let the people know. Getting started with Fountain is easy. You can add Bitcoin to your Fountain wallet by using your fiat accounts or any lightning wallet and one of my favorite features is that once you're using the app you can earn sats just by listening on fountain check out the link in the show notes to get started with fountain today